the Know Your Gear podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Know Your Gear podcast, episode 356. And I hope you guys had a fantastic week. And uh, we have a lot today on the show, a lot of stuff going on, some announcements, some questions, some subjects. And uh, uh, let's just get into it, shall we? Okay, so the first thing I want to do is uh, make the announcement to thank the sponsors of this channel, or of this show, I should say, which are the patrons and the channel members. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to just tell you I appreciate you you guys as always and of course all of you guys who come live and of course everybody who just watches and uh, gives a thumb up thumbs up maybe gives it a, a, a subscribe or just hangs out for a few minutes all right so that being said um we're gonna go uh another announcement that's interesting is um i, I we do have new merch so i put a link down below for the new merch and also more importantly i've been talking about um two new lines of pickups coming out soon and the first phase is coming out so if you guys don't know i make these pickups called black stock pickups uh the humbucker set that i make currently is called the northern lights um, I called it the Northern Lights because it has all the colors, sort of like all the, the sonic frequencies, right? To give you just a really beautiful sounding uh, low output PAF style neck pickup with a little bit hotter PAF style pickup in the bridge. And the impor most important part is I just want to thank uh, the patrons and the members for helping with this uh, project. And uh, my wife, Shauna, we were able to uh, get new packaging, new systems in place and everything in place and drop the prices dramatically. So uh, if you want, I'll put a link down below to check out the pickups if you would like. Okay, so let's get into some guitar talk. Um, first one comes from, uh, the Mongol. <laughs> okay. The Mongol says, uh, opinions on single pickup guitars. You know, it's funny. I did a video, uh, where I compared a single pickup guitar to a double humbucker pickup. So our double humbucker to a single humbucker guitar, uh, a la Eddie Van Halen, um, uh, Warren D Martini, you know, one bridge pickup kind of guitar. And, um, the theory was, or is, is that if you remove the neck pickup, then you increase the sustain. Well, guess what? In that video, that's exactly what I uh, was able to prove, is that removing the neck pickup does increase the sustain of the bridge pickup very slightly, very, very poquito, right? Just nothing. So, uh, Okay, so on the sound differences, um, yeah, I mean, it's on a graph and it was proven, you know, uh, with, but, you know, it wouldn't make me ever make that decision to rip a pickup out to get a little bit more sustain on my bridge. However, that being said, I just like something about the simplicity of a single pickup guitar. Just something really cool about it. Um, you know, one of the guitars I, I keep thinking about is a single P90 SG style guitar, something like that, you know. Um, but... There's a ton of single pickup guitars that I think are awesome. So I guess my opinion is I like them. Um, I really always think about this for years. I wish manufacturers, when they make student grade guitars, I think they should just make student grade guitars like a really nice setup neck with good frets and some decent tuners. And then literally just an unpainted body, just natural finished body with one pickup and a hardtail bridge. Basically, don't give them any frills, just give them playability and let them go. Uh, I don't know why uh, beginners, absolute beginners need multiple pickups if they're trying to save money. I think they can better quality student guitar uh, if they would just you know ditch the extra pickup or extra two pickups and then put that money into the fret work. So. Just my thought on that. Um, the next one came in. It says, I have uh, have an opportunity. This is from Daniel. He says, I have an opportunity to buy either a 2001 Made in Mexico Strat or a Highway 1 2012. So if you guys don't know, Highway 1s were a uh, were a American-made Fender or USA-made, depending on, how, you know, right, America, technically, you know, right, Mexico is America, but uh, USA-made in California uh, guitars that uh, were the precursor to the professional series, I believe. No, not the professional series. Something else after that. Doesn't matter. So I'll go into details of what the Highway 1 is in a second. But it is the precursor to the lower line of USA made guitars currently. So I think the professional is like the, the top tier production guitars besides the deluxes. And then underneath that, they call it something else, right? I forget what it's called. Um, he said, both are great. Which one is better? Oh, Casey Lee. I'm sorry. Uh, Casey Lee is the name, not Daniel. Uh, well... Uh, in my personal opinion, I prefer the Highway 1 in that scenario. Here's why. So a 2001 made Mexico Strat, so it would be pre-2010, 
10, obviously, which means it still has the smaller fret wire. So, so a couple things to know about Made in Mexico strats. Up until about 2010-ish, they were putting smaller fret wire on those guitars, which I was not a big fan of. And then, and then during the recession, they decided to go to like this Toyota, you know, uh, manufacturing concept where it just make things kind of like one area for tools, it kind of streamline stuff. And one of the things they did is they said just to use the same fret wire on the main USA guitars as the main Mexico's. So I'm not a big fan of the smaller fret wire and the main Mexico's pre 2010, but that wouldn't be such a determining factor except for the highway one has two features that I think are really cool. First thing is the highway one has a satin nitrocellulose finish, which I think is really cool um, because it's nitro and because it's satin, it's going to relic well. If it hasn't been relic, if it's been kept really good for the last 12 years, uh, then trust me, you're going to relic it pretty quickly. Um, my highway one, basically when I started playing it, I mean, it started getting wear spots and stuff. It just wears through. So I think it's kind of cool. So you get a kind of vintage vibe. The second thing cool about a highway one is that they have jumbo fret wire on them. So you get big jumbo frets. So that's something to think about. Other than that, the next I would say are pretty compatible. They're about nine and a half inch radius fretboards. The thicknesses are about the same. They're going to feel the same. Obviously, the Highway 1 will have the bigger 70s headstock. You may dig that, may not. So those are things. Aesthetically, do you like the smaller headstock versus the bigger? And do you like gloss versus nitro or satin? I shouldn't say nitro, satin. That's something to factor in. However, um, you know, for me, quality, uh, I'd say... I go highway. Now, so you know, pickup wise, they're pretty much identical pickups. So the Highway 1 series, I believe, got the Mexican frets or Mexican pickups in them. You know, it's hard when you're going back this far on all this stuff to memorize. Um, but yeah, so the pickups aren't a huge, to me, they aren't a huge benefit on the Highway 1s. They might be different. I can't remember. Uh, but uh, just saying that's not a, a decider for me. For me, it's the taller frets in the Highway 1 the satin finish nitro and it's a USA guitar and I'll always pick a USA one over a made in Mexico if it's equal. So, you know, I mean, I, like I said, I think the made in Mexico stuff is awesome. And if it's, uh, you know, 70% of the price, I think it's worth it, but you're, you're kind of alluding that might be the same price ish. So I'd say highway one. Um, this is Daniel. Sorry. Daniel says, what do you, what do I do when you feel like you're losing inspiration? You know, this is a question that's popped up over the years on the podcast, and um, I've given suggestions. Let me just tell you. So for me, there's two kind of problems with losing inspiration. There's work uh, loss of inspiration, and that's a real tough one for me because the you know I owe a content. I got to make these videos. YouTube is a is a rat race machine, and if I don't basically make these videos. Um, you know, it's tough. So it's really tough when you're not feeling it musically to perform. Um, but what I've learned is to just take a break. So um, when I'm when I don't have the inspiration, when I'm losing inspiration, I stop. I think forcing it isn't going to make it ever any better. Um, I've said I've talked about this before. Maybe go see some other musicians perform. Maybe go uh, listen to some new music, find some new stuff. But the reality is just go do something you like to do. <laughs> That's probably the best answer. And I, when I say that, this is exactly what I've learned to do over the years of doing this uh, YouTube stuff. You know, YouTube uh, doesn't seem doesn't appear to be a musical performance, but it is. I mean, you know, one thing about inspiration for me personally is sometimes I make a video and it's Look, I don't know. I have no idea. I make a video next week. It could get a million views and it could get 5,000. But just knowing that a million guitar players are going to watch me play guitar is a lot of pressure to, to you know, especially when, you know, you, not especially. It's just a lot of pressure, period. I'm performing in front of lots of people. And sometimes when I don't have the inspiration, I've learned, just go do something else. Go and go at nature hikes or go ride motorcycles or you know, take up skydiving. I don't know what it is. Do something else and find some inspiration in something else. Because at the end of the day, this is a joy thing. Find joy in it. And if you're not finding joy in it, don't be worried. It comes back. The, the inspiration comes back. The joy comes back. Everything comes back. Unless you sit there and beat your head against it, it won't work. So I would definitely go find something else to do. Uh, hyper bowl kid <laughs> says hey phil do you take part in gear facebook groups your thoughts are, if they are toxic or not um all internet stuff can be toxic you know it, or is toxic i should say what i mean by that is like the, all the forums there's always 
uh, the outliers. Um, do I go in them? No, I don't. Um, you know, I, I kind of lucked out, you know, one of the best pieces of advice they give you when you start a YouTube channel is to go to forums and post and, you know, and be part of the groups and grow your channel through talking to those communities. Um, but I didn't know to do that until after my channel had kind of gotten to a point where I didn't know really have to do that. So I was like, well, let me go poke in there now. And um, so that was my first, you know, kind of following out and going in those. Um, I don't want to speak ill with them, not because they'll rip you apart at night on the uh, Reddits and on the Facebooks and stuff, but, you know, I find that I, I started, I guess, the, okay, you know what, let's focus it this way. When I started going on the internet to learn about musical instruments, the first place I ever went to was Harmony Central. Do you guys remember Harmony Central? Some of you guys may not remember Harmony Central. Uh, it's, and now I think it's currently owned by Guitar Center. But Harmony Central was a website you could go to and read reviews. And one of the cool things about these reviews was you would go and it says, uh, you know, let's say you're interested in a Mesa Boogie uh, Mark V head. And, or, you know, and somebody would say Mark, Mesa Boogie Mark V head and they would give you the review. And then it said, how I think it said how old the player was or how long they've been playing in the instrument probably. And then it said the type of gear they own. And you look at that and they go, oh, they own some stuff like me. They've been playing for about as long as me. And now they're telling me what they think and I have a reference. And sometimes I would see things like, uh, you know, um, you know, they, they would review a piece of gear I was really interested in, I'd re and I'd see, like, owns a Line 6 Spider playing for three days. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, okay, well, you, no offense, you're not going to really help me in this scenario, right? I'm, uh, you know, I don't know if you're going to be able to come in and, and give me some pointers on a piece of gear yet. And I used to like Harmony Central for that. It was the first time I was like, okay, finally, you know. Keep in mind, people could have been lying about it, but at least it had the information. I kind of look at it now like I like video format now. To me, that was someone claiming something. Now a video format is showing me something. I like, personally, I don't like to take advice from anybody who's I can't see. You know, um, not because, oh, they have a lot of guitars behind them or they have a lot of amps and therefore they know what they're talking about. Um, I, I just want to kind of know what the person is, what their credentials are. Um, I learned the hardest way on this channel, every YouTube personality has that I've ever talked to that has engaged with every comment uh, they all do it at the beginning of the channel. There's a reason why you stop, not because the growth of the channel. It's because you realize a lot of people are just so full of crap that they are just wasting yours and everyone's time. And they're out there, man. They're just totally, totally posting nonsense. And they will spin you out, not in anger. It's not a troll thing. It's in a confusion. They will confuse you. And I used to think, and I really did, I used to think these were just the jerks they were just people going i'm just going to put out bad information and see how people uh, maybe that's happening but what low, slowly over time you realize they just have no they have no i don't know what it is they have no awareness <laughs> right they 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 just think for some reason because they you know it's like what's that commercial i stayed at a hilton or a radisson and now i'm a genius same thing um I, I say it all the time whenever I show you guys anything in my videos. I say, look, I've been doing this for, you know, a couple decades and this is how I do it. But there's a ton of ways to do it. And then I'll read a comment and somebody goes, no, there's only one way to do it. And this is the way. And I always think, OK, I get it. You know, you're hard. You're hard lined on what you believe. That's fine. But a lot of times I read those and I go, well, whatever you're suggesting won't even work. It won't even work. So uh, to answer your question, I don't go on the Facebook groups and I don't go on the forums and stuff mostly because not because it's toxic it's because i don't know who how to value those opinions i don't know how to put them against anything uh so in a video forum i just feel like i can figure it out um same thing now you know it's probably more confusing a lot of people talk about youtube and youtubers not being transparent but the transparency thing was really a problem a few years back now the laws have kicked in so much that even the ones that didn't want to tell you what they were up to are telling you to some degree and if you can't you can figure it out but i don't have anything against the groups and if you're finding joy in them please please find joy in them but that's i'm just giving you why i don't kind of jump in them um okay let me let me go to the next one Okay, let me load all these comments in. Here we go. Um, oh, there's so many, so many questions. <laughs> so many, so many things. Okay, working night eighty four says I don't know if this is a stupid question, but what is the solu what what solution would you suggest for a double humbucker guitar 
where I want to be able to split both pickups individually and only use a three-way switch. A push-pull or on both volume and tone, best choice, question mark? Thanks for being you. Okay, so you have two choices. Let me go to, you have two, you have three. You have three choices, so you know. Um, so let me show you your three choices for coil splitting in your options. And uh, it, hopefully it will be easy. Okay. Um, okay, so the first the first option is two push-pull or push-pull pots. So we all know that. So you can put two, uh, two volumes or a volume tone, you know, whichever you want, and, and you can assign uh, that basically each pickup will be coil split individually. That's what you already said, and uh, that's probably the best way. Then, of course, you could put two mini switches in your guitar to drill two holes, and kind of like how PRS does with the custom 2408s and stuff, and puts two switches and do it that way. The third option is this option right here. This is the freeway ultra switch. This looks like a three-way switch. It fits in a three-way switch, but it has six positions. And uh, so you're going to click here and look at that, the freeway ultra switch. And you can do all of this stuff, <laughs> okay? Um, so that um, is another option. So you know, um, it's $65 for that switch. So probably more expensive than two, two push pulls. I would imagine two push pulls are about $15 a piece. So about 30 bucks, so about double the, 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 the amount. But I just, you asked what the options are. Those are your three options. Um, let's see. Um, okay. Glenn wants to know possible, possibly a suggestion for online guitar lessons. It seems there are so many these days. Uh, I am sure the majority of them are good. However, is there a specific site that you suggest? It's been challenging for me to pick one. So Glenn, yes. So there is an insane amount of uh, guitar lessons and it's going to keep growing because it's very lucrative. Um, you know, people who teach lessons online can make, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, millions of dollars a year. And on the low end, you know, t tens of thousands of dollars a year on the low end. So there, it's very lucrative. Um, because, you know, people don't really understand the concept. You know, it's like, oh, it's only $30 a month or $10 a month. And you're like, okay, but this is the internet, which means it's the whole world. So you're not going to get 10 people. You're going to get 1,000 people. So, yeah, it gets a little overwhelming. Um, the one I suggest is the one I like the most, and it's Tim Pierce. Um, you, so you just go to Tim Pierce Masterclass. Here's why, Glenn, I'm going to suggest it to you so you know. I'm going to suggest it to you because he gives you two weeks for free. I know him very well. And um, there is no tricky trick to that. Okay, I'm not saying it. Everybody else that has that, try it. And, you know, before you buy it, kind of thing. I don't know if they have tricks or not. I just know he doesn't. So here's what I do know, Glenn. You can go sign up for the master class and uh, and you poke around for a week or so. You know, and just make sure if you you don't want to do it, cancel it. But if you cancel it, you won't get hard feelings. There won't be a trick. It won't be a weird thing where you have to mail in a letter. You know. You know it's not like uh, quitting a gym. Uh, it's pretty easy and you can poke around there and uh, get a sense of it. And uh, that's why I recommend it. Now, other people are going to have other recommendations too. But the reason I recommend it is I've taken it. I liked it. And also I can tell you that you can try it before you buy it. And that's pretty damn cool. Um, Greg says, Greg Peterson says, I've never seen a YouTuber discuss wet dry with pedals. I would say the pedal show, I've seen them talk about it. Or the wet dry rig, if you guys don't know, is a very, you know, a not a common thing, a very uncommon thing. To me, it's just too much stuff going on, two amps going on. I tried it once. Uh, I think I recall watching Lee Anderton from Anderton's doing a video a long time ago where he did the same thing I did. He kind of experimented with it and see how he liked it. And he's like, this is amazing. I'm never doing it again. I think that's what I remember. Here's what I can tell you. Exactly. That's how I did it. I did it and I went, yep, that's amazing. I'm never doing this again. This is too much stuff. It's just more stuff. Uh, to plug and do stuff, but I get it. I, if you haven't done it, I highly suggest it because uh, you know it's really cool and it sounds amazing. There's no, no, um, there's no like taking away from how good it sounds. Okay, uh, Greyhound Mike says, "Is there any truth to the comment my friend made 
I don't know your friend, man. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it says that I shouldn't buy from Guitar Center because they get the guitars that don't meet the quality requirements of other stores. I hear that all the time. You know who started that crap? Other stores. The mom and pops. It is such bull. It's such bull. There's no way. Let me explain the two things. Okay. So let me tell you what I don't know, and I'll tell you what I do know. Okay. <laughs> what I don't know. I heard, just like you, that like... Uh, I heard that Costco and Walmart get the best produce. I heard that they buy so much of it that the farmers give them their best stuff. And then I heard that they get the worst produce because they buy so much of it that the farmers have to give them whatever they can to make the orders. Okay, I have no idea if that's true. So the reason why I tell you that is because I can tell you what's true in our industry. Uh, Guitar Center, like Sweetwater, like all the guys who can put in the big orders they get whatever they want <laughs> okay now if you're asking me if guitar center was to say they wanted substandard product at some kind of discount it's possible rumors all start because they either are true have some truth or just somebody has an agenda in this case there might be some truth like for instance a company might have felt wronged by how aggressive Guitar Center was on their pricing to get their pricing down with a vendor and the vendor may have sent them substandard product and then told somebody like, yeah, I send Guitar Center my lower crap because they don't pay as well as my other vendors or my other dealers. And then maybe that translates. But I can tell you the Guitar Center, the volume they buy it, there's no, they just ship it out. Everybody just ships it out. There's, it's not that controlled. So the answer is uh, no. What is true, though, with Guitar Center is that they let everybody play with the stuff. And so a lot of the stuff you pick up in the stores has been played by 30 different people for 30 different uh, for 30 hours. And so it's going to have a used kind of feel or, you know, it's going to have issues because somebody's done stuff to it. Um, so. So yeah, the answer is no. Don't, you don't have to, that's, that's not true. Um, and I'm not saying it's not true because uh, I think it's not true. I know it's not true. I've, I've had to work with a lot of companies. Um, you know, as uh, one thing about the YouTube gig is as I was taking off with YouTube, you know, I had to find ways to make money besides YouTube. So I would start working, uh, uh, you know, with companies, uh, not doing YouTube, doing all kinds of other stuff I could do. And so one of the, one of the comp two companies I work for, I had to work with Guitar Center, work some stuff out with Guitar Center and Guitar Center buys a lot and basically gets what they want. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, the next part to Greyhound's question is, are Fender Custom Shop's current prices reflective of inflation? Um, yes and no. I mean, everything's going to be uh, increased because of inflation. But if you want my opinion, it's just because they added a little in there too. I think I believe Fender as a whole, this is different than what I said about Guitar Center where I kind of know something. This is just my my feeling, my gut feeling feels like from what, I fe what I've seen and how all companies have, have done pricing. Fender comes across like it added a little bit to what it needed to. So if it needed to increase prices 10%, it went ahead and did it for 15% to see because they wanted the profit. So, and before somebody comments like, oh, sometimes they raise the price a little bit more to cover the losses and all that stuff. I, I'm factoring all that into. I'm saying, if you ask me, if Fender had to inflate the prices 10% that covers everything and they were fine, I feel like they went an extra five on that just because they could you know, because they could do it. They can get away with it. Um, he says, or have they opted to position themselves as a status symbol? Well, they are They are a status symbol. They, are, I mean, Fender and Gibson are the go-to brands. He says, now there are 2X the price of a Kiesel, a Badlands, and about that of a G&L also. Well, there's a reason for that too. Um, are all California made... Are all California made so best comparison? Oh, okay, okay. So what he's saying is uh, they're twice the prices of Kiesel. Well, Kiesel guitars, so let's start with this. First of all, let's be very clear. Badlands is up the price dramatically. I mean, the last run of Badlands guitars is is a 30% increase, 30% over the very first guitar. So you have to do factor that in. The very first red line, just, just to be aware, the very first red line was $2,500. The solid color series was also $2,500, but the red line had $800 paint job in it. So you have to look at it like they call it shrinkflation, right? That's what the solid color guitars were. They were the shrinkflation. You paid the same price, but you lost $800 in value. Plus, you didn't get the swag. Swag added another 200 bucks in value. So they were $1,000 more. 
if you factor that in, if you think of it that way. So, so Badlands does have inflation. It's just it's part of the you know it's part of the market that's going on with all companies. But uh, Kiesel, Badlands, and GNL all have something in common too, which is they're growing markets. Uh, GNL shouldn't be because they've been around for a long time. <laughs> Um, but they are still growing markets, and they're not in the best of ways. So um, uh, what I mean by that means they're not booming like Fender and those guys. So Fender and Gibson, they're they're going to charge whatever they want because they have a market share and they're doing great. Kiesel, Badlands, and GNL is struggling to grab more market. Now, keep in mind, I, Jeff, as you know, Kiesel is doing great, but he's still growing his business. I mean, his business has only been around since 2015 as Kiesel, so he's still got to grow it. So he's going to be aggressive, more aggressive than I think he sh even should be. He's really awesome pricing. So his prices, I think, are probably the most aggressive on the market in the USA, period. Um, okay, Rich, let me drink some water. He says, you were talking recently about Sam Ash having to improve their online presence moving forward. I bought some things from them recently and had one and... One has to be returned, a new guitar with a sizable finish chip, and I realized what a precarious position the customer is in. I had to contact customers, customer, I, I had to contact customers, I think service, send photos, and then await decisions by management team. I believe they are going to allow me to exchange the guitar, but it's unsettling while waiting for the decision. What if for some Arbitrary reason they decided not to honor my request. They will. They'll take care of you. What is the recourse I would have? Um, well, you, your recourse is you have customer protection. You, you bought the product new. You will receive a new product or you will receive your money back. They don't have to have a policy for that. That's, I mean, assuming you haven't kept it for a reasonably amount of a long period of time. Uh, dealing with Sweetwater is so much easier. It is. It is. Um, you have... A person to work with and they almost always um, give you confidence that they will do the right thing I believe Sam Ash will continue to lose business unless they figure out how to give customers more confidence I do not work for Sam Ash Guitar Center or Sweetwater I don't work for any of these companies none of these companies are giving me a check or a uh, what do you call it or a, you know health care program or anything for any of this stuff in some cases they reach out all those three companies. I have worked with all three companies in some degree to them sending product out for review or them, uh, you know, sponsoring a video by, you know, giving me payments so I can sponsor some idea that I had for a video. And in some cases, giving me some kind of uh, um, affiliate links. Now, I realize that's payment. That's, uh, that's so I'm not saying I've never been paid for them. What I'm saying is I don't work for them. That's not how my contracts work for them. The reason I tell you that is because I want you to understand that when I tell you that I've spent time at all these places, that Sweetwater is the best. It's not like they're my best friends. Like, I like them the best. They're the coolest dudes. Or, you know, it's not that. I'm not saying, oh, wow, they are, you know, whatever. <laughs> they, they, they send me candy. It's not that. It's, I'm telling you, um, as someone who had to do this as a small mom and pop, as someone who's worked with these bigger retail companies, and then when you go and watch how Sweetwater's running things, it is, it is far. It is either the worst idea ever or it's the best idea ever. And here's the thing. They're winning, so I'm going to say it's the best idea ever. Yes. So the way they handle customer service is impressive. The way they handle everything is super impressive to the point where you can see the amount of money they throw at it. And I don't know if it's the culture, although it seems a little bit of that. You have to understand it's the same logic of Amazon. It's like I bought this thing and then Amazon's just like, take it back. No problems. No questions. Here's your new one. Here's your money back. No, right. There's a, whether you, how you feel about that is irrelevant. The idea is that you know, that is easy. Like you said, no one wants to feel like their money is trapped or their situation is bad because they just wanted to buy something to enjoy themselves. So Sweetwater, it's crazy to watch how they return products and how they do stuff. It's really efficient. Um, some of you are going to probably put comments because there are always somebody like, oh, I had a bad experience. You're going to have a bad experience. I'm not saying they don't have bad experiences. What I'm saying is, is that the amount of bad experiences to the volume they're doing are very small. It's very small. So, yeah, it's going to be tough. I, I, I've been saying it. Look, I, I said this earlier about the market. 
Um, I was screaming, uh, literally, I used to yell in the mic more than I do now. I was yelling in 2019. Uh, 2019 is when I started. I started in 2019 by saying, "There's you can go back to all my podcasts. All my stuff is documented saying Sweetwater is going to crush all these guys. They're going to crush them. Not because Sweetwater was like cooler or I liked their logo more or I thought they had a better selection of guitars. I was just watching what they were doing going, this is insane. They are literally trying to beat everyone. They're not trying to match everyone. They're they're literally trying to own mar the end market. It's impressive on every level. Um, even if you don't like it, it's still impressive. So to answer your question, I think Sam Ash will take care of you. Yes, I'm sure it will be uh, the situation you you are telling me sounds a little uh, frustrating for sure, um, but they will take care of you. And uh, yes, I'm hoping that they are able to put more in, uh, into that, you know, put more energy into their web system. Um, I've had a lot of people, when I talked about that a couple weeks ago, a lot of people were telling me like, Phil, I went on their website. It's fine. I'm like, yeah, you didn't buy from it though. You just went and looked at it. I'm fine with that. I'm not here to argue with you guys. I, I, I don't know everything. I'm not trying to come across that way. I'm trying to say like, I, I test things. And then this is how I, this is how I feel about the tests I perform. And then somebody gives me an opinion about not doing it. It's hard for me to argue you against you when I'm like, have you done it? And they're like, no. And I'm like, well, how am I supposed to do? How am I, where am I supposed to go with that? You didn't try it. I tried it. This is my opinion. So um, as someone who's bought from all the stores, I will tell you the easiest to buy from and return is Guitar Center. <laughs> They're the absolute easiest um, because I can buy from Guitar Center online and just go return it to a store. That's pretty damn efficient. Um, I got an amp. So, you know, I got an amp. I bought an expensive amp from Guitar Center 2021 you'd have to go back to the podcast to talk about it it's very expensive amp they shipped it to me and they shipped it from a store even though i bought it online as new in box and it was missing the power cable the foot switch and i think something else and it didn't have the original box i didn't really care about the original box but i was like wait a minute man this thing was like three grand are you kidding me three grand it's like so what was great was i didn't have to call i didn't have to scream i didn't have to get a shipping label i didn't have to do anything i just walked it down to the guitar center and they just took it back and gave me a full refund on my card and that was the end of it so i mean that's really cool another th cool thing was i was in san diego uh for the kiesel event and i bought a prs mt15 and it was uh it was a uh, it was a floor model and um, it sounded great. So I bought it. But what was nice buying it was knowing that if I bought it, I had any issues or if I didn't like it, when I got back home, I could just take it to the Guitar Center here and return it. So Guitar Center's got the return system down, probably the best because they got the locations. Then I would say Sweetwater in taking care of you and, and then Sam Ash. In my experience from buying all three, that is the thing. And then I think Reverb's the third. Almost like Reverb is, whether you buy from somebody, obviously a personal person or a store, I feel like Reverb's always like a, you might as well almost <laughs> give it up. And some people are going to say, no, Reverb service is great. Reverb customer service is great. But it's still, it's still tough. So there's a lot of things to pay attention to. All right, let me go to the screen and answer Steve's question. His question is, how come other companies don't have a demo shop like Gibson does on Reverb Seems like a good way to get rid of seconds. So a lot of companies do. Uh, what you could do, let's see if we can do it right now. We can go here on the internet. Um, and I believe the, the, yes. So here's how you want to do it. Okay. So um, just go to Google and type in the company you want. I just did ESP. So I put ESP Reverb Shop, and this is what came up, e ESP Clearance Warehouse. So this is ESP's Clearance Warehouse. So same thing, let me go back to here. So if we go here, um, let's do something else. Um, you would have to try all the brands, right? So um, I'll try Ibanez, let's see if they have one. Ibanez Reverb Shop, and Ibanez. I mean, it does not have a reverb shop. <laughs> so, but that's how you would do it. So you would look, oops, I'm sorry, I'm going back. You would go and type in the brand you're looking for in a, a reverb shop. So more companies than just Gibson has uh, reverb shops. Gibson's is the most unique because like I said, they're selling the, the seconds and reverbing. It's a really cool idea. Um, you know, uh, one of the cool things that they do is, uh, is if you go to the Gibson shop, uh, 
there's a, a funny thing, you know, sometimes they, they do the stuff where they paint the guitars, they paint the, the Gibsons and they'll put a stinger on the back of the headstock and stuff. And that's because like, like one, I noticed they took a, uh, they took a less, a, a slash signature, Les Paul, and then they painted it and then they painted the back so you couldn't see it and they made it look, and it's not labeled as a signature sign, slash Les Paul, but it was. And then I got confirmation from Gibson. That's what it was too. So I was like, oh, that's really, really interesting. I'm like, so they had a de defective slash Les Paul. So I think something was probably wrong with the finish and they go, let's paint it crazy. And I think they did a sparkle finish, like sparkle top on a white body and then put a sparkle stinger on the back of the headstock and change the um, truss rod cover and stuff. And basically, I think they probably left the pickups the same, I don't remember, but they essentially took a, a signature model, made it a non-signature model and sold it and sold it for a good amount of money. So it's a good idea. Um, not all companies care, <laughs> Stephen, that's the problem. Uh, you know, Gibson, uh, the, as we know, Gibson is really focused on money as a company they're focused on every dime they can get they're going to get and um some companies don't, don't focus that way they just focus on other things they figure that stuff uh, you know what's the saying stepping over dollars to pick up pennies so to speak um you know sometimes it's looked at as that too i think personally i think the gibson demo shop's cool i've tried to buy a couple things from there a couple time time i go on there and i just always end up talking myself out of it uh Tim wants to know if I've ever tried Mad Hatter's solderless system. I have. Mad Hatter is a company that's here in Arizona where I live. I bumped into him once in a guitar center. He was very nice to me, I think. I think that's what I remember. Um, and I even used one of his systems in one of my Sharpen Max videos early, early, early on. And that's about it. Um, it's good stuff, but there's a ton of competitors out there now. Uh, you know, I don't know of any reason why his is superior to theirs. Uh, so what I mean by that is when I think of like, you know, all those kit systems out there from GFS or from 920 or from him or from, you know, now it's just on and on and on. So many companies are in the game. Um, he was definitely early adopter and seemed like a pretty cool system. But like I said, there's so many people in the game now. I don't really necessarily pay attention to, I, to enough to know who's better, who's better quality than anyone else. They all seem about... They seem the same, but I'd have to look at them more to know. Um, okay. Okay, John wants to know, bouncing off my super chat question from last week about, do that, about something. <laughs> what is it? Okay, bouncing off his super chat question from last week about Epiphone nearing Gibson retail pricing, how will two, sorry, similar guitars fare in the used market in the future? Same example, new Epiphone Karina Explorer for $1,300 versus Gibson Demo Shop Explorer for $1,300. Um, well, you know, part of the thing is there's two factors in there. You, you know, it's not just the old days of the Gibson branding versus Epiphone branding or USA made versus Chinese made product anymore. Really what's happening is um, there is a new phenomena that is the YouTube and the social media arenas that have created new interesting effects, okay? And here's what I mean by that. So let's say, you know, Epiphone comes out with a guitar you know, in 1992 and they put ads in Guitar World and, you know, and they're, they're in the stores and you see one and you buy one. Now, you didn't get one. So you think about it all the time. You know, you're like, oh, I always wanted one and you can't get one. And you're looking for them on Reverb and, you know, you come across one, you see it and you buy it. And there's probably two other people looking for it because they remember it too from the guitar ads in 92. And, um, you know, because there's three people want it, you know, the price holds pretty good value, pretty good. And you get it. That was about how it worked. Now how it works is Epiphone makes a limited edition guitar, make a guitar, they stop making it, but 10 YouTubers and social media influencers or, and I mean influencers, I mean just anybody who puts out content out there, they made tons of videos and those videos are out there floating around. And then 10 years later, you're watching YouTube or Instagram or whatever, and then these things come in your feed, and you're like, oh, I didn't know about that guitar. I'm going to go on Reverb and look right now. Now there's 50 of you looking for a guitar. There's only three of them on Reverb, right? And you guys gobble them up, and then the prices go up. So we keep seeing that. So discontinued products seems to still hold a ton of value because of the fact that there's these forever evergreen content that's just re-hitting you with product. I actually get it a lot. Um, 
where I've done videos like anybody, I've done a ton of videos and the product I did the video of, it's no longer around anymore. It's neither discontinued or it's, it was limited edition to begin with or whatever. And then I'm getting comments all the time. I even get people emailing me going, Hey, Phil, you did a video and I'm this guitar. I can't find them anywhere. And I'm like, yeah, it's cause that was three years ago and good luck. You know, I, I'm sorry. Um, so to how they fare that way that we don't know. But to your core of your question is like a Gibson versus an Epi Epiphone. I mean, unless the world changes, it's always going to be Gibson than Epiphone. It's always going to be that way. Somebody always wants a Gibson more than an Epiphone for the most part. This is where somebody's queuing in the comments. Not me. I want an Epiphone over Gibson. Well, that's good for you. <laughs> that's your, that's, I understand that mentality exactly. But, you know, people want Gibson. It's just how it's always been. That's uh, the proof in the pudding. It would be how many Epiphone t-shirts do you see versus how many Gibson t-shirts? Uh, okay. Uh, Leftover Pizza says, now that the Epiphone has finally put the Gibson style mustache headstock on some of their new guitars, do you think it will become a permanent, eventually, permanent, eventually on Epiphones? Um, I don't know. You know, let's just go with the greed attitude of Gibson is whatever will pay them the most amount of money is what they'll do. What I mean by that is if they think putting that headstock on all the guitars will make them more money, they'll do it. If they think limiting that headstock and putting it on guitars, but then jacking up the prices will make them more money, they'll do it. There seems to be a whatever nets more money mentality with Gibson. And I'm not saying greed is bad. And I'm not even saying that, you know, that companies, the other companies don't act like this. What I'm saying is, is that sometimes companies make decisions for a ton of different reasons. And sometimes companies make decisions for one reason, one focus, one agenda. There seems to be one focus, one agenda, one, like that's it. It's, you know, um, I mean, look, I've talked to, to, uh, guitar companies that, um, you know, they're very money focused, but then they go, did I tell you, Phil, you know, I got so-and-so to do a signature run with us and I'm, you know, they're giddy because they're like, I've never, I always never thought I'd meet this, you know, this player and now they're going to be playing one of my guitars and they didn't write the most lucrative deal. Gibson doesn't ever seem like anything is ever done because it's like, man, this will be cool or people will dig this or this will advance our marketing or this will be exciting for the community. It's always like, we can really make this much if we do this. So everything seems to be a money decision for them. And, um, so I would imagine whatever continues that, unless they see something different. So, um, okay. Dan wants to know, hey Phil, how much influence does the choice of your first guitar make for others that may follow? It is massively huge, so you know. Um, in in the in the norm it's going to guarantee or di dictate all what you like going forward from now on. That is the norm. In the exception, it will dictate exactly what you hate and you'll play everything but that because you hated it so much. Usually whatever emotional, whatever emotion you attach to your first guitar. Either the guitar is amazing, not because it's amazing, you know, over time you learn that your guitar, so you gotta understand when you get your first guitar, there's always this moment of that's an amazing moment. And then over time, you start realizing its limitations or over time, you realize that you didn't buy the, the cool one or you didn't know the cool stuff or whatever, or it wasn't your thing. Um, but at first, the, the attachment is going to be very strong. So people tend to stick with it. So if you, if I can tell you from just talking to thousands of guitar players uh, over the years, man, everybody's lines up pretty easy. It's like, my first guitar was a Strat knockoff. What do you play now? I play Strats. <laughs> my first guitar was a Hondo, you know, Gibson knockoff. What do you play now? I play a Gibson. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it does seem to fall that way with few exceptions, you know, and I mean few, it's exactly that, few exceptions. So it is a big part of that. It really connects. Um, my first guitar was a Strat copy. Look at me. I'm playing Strat copies all the time, although I absolutely love single cuts uh, epically. I just find myself constantly going back to strats for comfort. It's just the feel. So there you go. Um, okay, let's go back here. Um, hi, Phil. Okay, hi. It says, thoughts on the Strandberg Bowden Essential guitar. Okay, let's take a look at that. So... What they're asking me is about is that Stramberg Guitars has come out with a new line of guitars that they 
I saw a lot of videos out there about. And uh, it's one of those things, like I would probably be super excited about it. I think it was probably, yeah, here it is. Okay, let's share it with you. So Strandberg has a new uh, line of guitar called the Essential Six or the Essential Guitars. What this is is satin finish guitars. This one's in a salmon pink and uh, it's got a hardtail bridge. It is $1,000. I believe these are still made in Indonesia. They are still made in Indonesia from what I can tell there. It's hard to see. Um, these do not have the fan frets. That was the first thing I noticed. So non-fan frets, uh, guitar. That is the part I don't know. I don't know how to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. So like I've played, you know, the, the fan fret guitars with the indoor neck and the fan fret system. It's a pretty damn cool guitar. As you know, I also have the true temperament system, which is not really fan, but a little bit fan. So here's my thing. I have not, so this is what I was talking about earlier about forums, you know, listening to somebody who doesn't know. <laughs> don't listen to me because I'm about to tell you what I don't know. My first thought is it's going to jack up my hand. I don't know why. Um, it actually scares the living crap out of me. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you. Um, it, it is a guitar that I I didn't know because, you know, I, I've done some reviews from Strandberg. I didn't know if they're going to reach out and try to send one on the channel do a deep dive. If they would have, I would have definitely done it, um, you know, because I think it'd be interesting to find out. But if you're asking me like, well, I get one and I, you know, I tell you guys all the time, if you guys ask me like this kind of guitar is kind of cool. I've been wanting a thousand dollar Strandberg for the masses out there. You know, um, as someone who's a fan of Strandberg, I would really like, you know, Hey, more players to get their hands on a Strandberg and give it a try. But the Endura neck is kind of different. The way it positions your hands is different. And the fan frets always seem like they lined up with it. And in my head, without touching the guitar, it actually like hurts. It hurts my wrist to think about what position my hand might be in doing that. Now I have no reason to think that. So, you know, I, it might be fine. It might be better. I have no idea. But to me, it's the Endura neck, Endura neck with the fan fret system is what is different about the guitar. So I was a little weirded out by that when I first saw it. At first, I didn't even notice it. I was like, oh, that's cool. They did it. And I was so excited. I was going to tell you guys, I even had it earmarked for one of the podcasts to talk about like big announcement. They're doing it. It's great. I'm super excited. And then when I saw that change. I go, okay, I don't know. And then I got thought, oh, did they change the neck profile? Like the back, but I don't see where they changed the neck profile. So if I get a chance, if I'm out and about and there happens to be one in a you know guitar center or somewhere and I get to put my hands on one, if I get to put my hands on one, I will definitely give you, uh, you know, some kind of input. If uh, I would love to say if you guys get your hand on and give, give me input, but this is something personal to me. Like, it's not like, uh, you know, tell me how it sounds. You know, I literally would have to play it for at least 20 minutes to know if it's, it's going to cause any issues. Uh, I would really just hate to have an issue with it. Um, so... Uh, I'm excited about uh, Strandberg, thousand dollars, the Bowden, but I'm a little a little concerned about the changes to what that means in the long term. And if they tested it, and I don't know if it, you know, I don't know. It's one of those things. It's an unproven product, is what it is. When we had the store, that was one of the things that sometimes we get in a little bit of conflict with a vendor, was they would go, "Hey, we want you to carry twenty of these," and I'd be like. I don't want to carry these. And they're like, well, you know, you, you know, you carry all our stuff. And I go, yeah, but this, this is a new product. And I don't know. It looks, it's different. It's different than what you've been doing before. It's not a new color. It's not a slight design. This is a re redesign. So I, I want to see how it goes <laughs> before I, you know, end up with problems with them. So, you know, that's one of the things about nice. It's one of the things that's nice about, um, well, you know what? This is a good segue. Check this out. I had a, an issue with a company recently. Uh, nothing, nothing dramatic, but uh, it's actually, um, but it was interesting to see why they didn't understand our logic. We were explaining to them they were a new product that no one's had their hands on. Uh, new, you know, new, new product, new, new company sending, they want to send us some product. They want us to do a video. So I, I assess the situation. I assess everything that's going to happen. And then Shauna goes, okay, this is what it's going to cost to do the video. And I gave her the numbers. I go, I think this is what it's going to take me. It's going to take me three to four days to kind of get used to it, see what it is and see how it goes. I got, I need a day for referencing the material, you know, to learn about it. 
and I got to do a little research on the company and see, you know, how, how they do, what their returns are. You know, I got to get all this information. And so this is why the story's funny. She goes, so does that mean you don't want to do it? I go, no, no, no. I just need you to understand how much workload is involved in it. And so she goes, okay. So she reaches out to the company and she, I'm copied. So we all are all talking and we say, this is what it's going to cost. And they're like, that's ridiculous. And I'm like, they go, you know, <laughs> so, so we're like, well, that's, that's the time involved it takes to do the, the, the video. And, and basically I think what they threw in our face was like, well, I saw you did a video and you didn't charge a company. So I don't understand that. And I go, well, yeah, like if a company like Paul Smith or Gibson, I hate to say it, or Fender or someone who's like, hey, we have a new 2025 Strat coming out. We'd like to send one to the channel and do a video. I'm like, sure. All I have to assess is a few things. What's the new color? What's the changes? I don't have to worry about what's the return policy with Fender and how will Fender be here by the time I finish this video or will they abscond with everybody's money off to a third world country? Like, I don't have to worry about all this stuff. I don't do all this research. You know, I don't have to figure out if it's a repackaged product that you're taking and it's not even your product or if you have put any time in it at all. Like I said, there's, you know, it's it's uh, it's an interesting thing. So this goes with the, the Strandberg thing. As much as I love Strandberg and the company, they've been great to the channel. This is a new unproven product to me so it falls in that same thing it's like i'm weary of it until i learn more about it because it's different <laughs> it's, it's and i but i appreciate them trying new things and so same with that one company i'm like uh, i understand what you're saying but there's no way i'm going to spend a week of my life to figure out everything about your company so i can finally do a video uh in hopes that somebody might find the video interesting that's a lot of crazy things to ask so that's a, any companies listening, keep that in mind. Cause I'm, you know, same thing. I just deal with it. So, you know, I just filmed, I don't know, I'm off this tirade. I just filmed a video, finished half editing and I got halfway through it and then reached out to the company and I had a lot of questions and some of them I'm weary of. And then basically gave me some answers I didn't like. That video is never getting finished. So I lost the whole day and a half. It's gone. So. And, um, they're not even, that was, I'm so, you know, I don't want you to confuse it. That wasn't a paid video or anything. That was, uh, I thought it would be, I thought you guys would find it interesting, but now I'm not comfortable with letting you guys, uh, uh, you know, promoting a product that may end up with you guys uh, with, you know, headaches or stress or money issues or whatever the deal is. There you go. Okay. Um, we should switch gears. Let's do that. What should we do? I know what we should do. We should do the guitar of the week. <laughs> Yay, it's the guitar of the week. Um, I want to tell you, somebody, a viewer sent me a song, a guitar of the week song. Thank you for sending it to me. I listened to it. We thought about playing it, but it's just, we didn't have the time to get it ready. We're going to probably do it just because we think it'd be fun. So I want to I want to share guitar of the week. And uh, this is a new segment on the on the podcast. I thought it'd be fun. Every, each week, I'll, I'll share a guitar with you. So let's do guitar of the week. Picking out the All right, guys, I'm picking out the guitar for the guitar of the week. While you're waiting, please hit the like and subscribe button to help this channel. I appreciate that and helping the podcast grow. And uh, what guitar am I picking? Well, let's see. Here it is. Okay. So, see that's my little thing. Uh, guitar of the week. It is my Nags single cut. And... Uh, okay, I don't know why I'm having so much trouble with this. Uh, this is the Kanai. Okay, so let's let's just share it. I'm sorry about this. Okay, so I have this Nags single cut Kanai. So uh, what's interesting about Nags guitars, if you don't know anything about Nags, let me explain it. I on my second channel, I have an interview with Joe Nags and uh, Peter Wolf, who are the owners of Nags. Joe Nags was uh, the guy who ran uh, PRS cust our custom shop, private stock. And he spun off and started his own company. He's down the road from them. And essentially with his designs and a couple of ideas. And so I own a couple of his guitars. They're very expensive, but he has no um, like import versions. He has no, um, you know, anything like that. They just do ex extremely beautifully made custom USA made instruments. Uh, and they have different tiers. They have a three tier system and they get more expensive as they go. This one, a couple cool things to know, is this one is a beautiful, I want to say, let me switch the views here. It's a beautiful, like it's white, but it's almost like an ivory white. It's really great. And then they use this 
seafoam green. This is painted, and then there's like this beautiful pinstriping almost. Look at that. Just the way they did that. And then uh, this one's been modified. So uh, let me go over it. So mahogany body. Okay, there you go. Set neck, mahogany neck, ebony fretboard, a bone nut. We have Cluson tuning keys, but they are not locking. And this one I modified in a couple ways. So first thing you'll notice is he has his own kind of bridge, which is cool. The modifications I made was the originally when I bought this, I bought this and it had black knobs. So I found these knobs on reverb that match the finish. And I thought this would look really cool. So I did that. Then I didn't like the black pickup rings because I lost the black knobs. So I went ahead and switched to matching pickup rings that match the color of the body. And then the switch tip was black and I switched that to chrome. Uh, it's a metal chrome switch tip and it's great. And then I switched the pickups. So originally the pickups were some bare knuckles. They usually use Duncans or bare knuckles and I just wasn't feeling it. So I switched these out for some Northern Lights. These are the black stock Northern Lights pickups. Um, and let me let me just go over it. So a couple things that are probably interesting to know. I'm running through a Fender 65 Deluxe Reverb. Yep. <laughs> just wanna make sure that's true. There you go. And uh, everything's set up. So let me let me demo it a little bit. Let me play it for you. I'll start with clean, if you don't mind, and uh, give you a little samples of the guitar and then I'll, I'll talk about a few other things. Here we go. What's interesting is this is the neck pickup. We go to the bridge. When I did the uh, the bridge pickup, what I did is I did it in a way that it has a lot of power if you have distortion, but on clean, it's got a very single coil. That's my bridge pickup clean. Let's go again. So there we go. And then let's go ahead and switch to an overdrive. So I'm going to go ahead and switch on the OD11, which is just a light overdrive pedal. And we'll start with the bridge. Now what I like is on the bridge, I like a bridge pickup when I'm running it through overdrive, I like it to have like a fast attack. When I switch the neck, I like everything to be a little warmer because I'm going to play a little slower. So let's uh, let's talk about this for a second. So a couple things. So the guitar plays amazing, as you can imagine. Uh, 
the guitar, I think, looks amazing. I just, I loved it. It's got that, to me, it's like the 57 Chevy kind of 50s diner kind of look. In fact, I originally thought about going this way. I originally thought about putting some salt and pepper shaker looking knobs on here and make it look a diner. I almost did that. I might do it one day, a little chrome knobs. I'm going to switch the switch tip. <laughs> pretty cool okay so a couple things to note um i don't know what's to note the uh the guitar spoke to me is really cool this is funny because this is what they're not known for if you look up nags uh k-n-a-g-g-s you'll notice that mostly are known for these beautiful wood guitars and i just thought this finish looked fantastic and i have to say that <laughs> when i first saw it the first time i ever saw this finish i was thinking like how did they what did they do they had to tape this all off and paint this and then so I think what they did is they taped it off, painted it, and then they used, a, like, this is a water decal or something. They did something for the inlay. So this isn't inlaid in there. I think it's just a decal hiding the to blend, you know, to, to hide where the two colors meet, and they blend. So definitely amazing guitar. The neck is uh, not chunky at all. It's uh, definitely uh, thinner than a 59 Les Paul for sure, but thicker than a 60s Les Paul, so something like that. And uh, has a beautiful ebony truss rod cover. And then I think I said this. Let's put this back. That. Oh, actually, let me do that. I think I said this, that all the uh, Nags guitars are named after uh, rivers, which are, that have Indian names. So that's, that's pretty cool. We talked about that on the podcast. So very, very cool. And um, I, I was going to do a review of that guitar. <laughs> so you guys know, I was going to do a deep dive. A lot, of, a lot of you asked me to do a deep dive. And then I made a mistake. And here was the mistake. I was f didn't think about it. <laughs> and then one weekend, I got the parts and I was like, okay, I'm going to swap everything over. And then when I was swapping everything, I don't know what it was. I just wasn't falling in love with the bridge pickup of the guitar. And so I go, I'm going to swap it out. So I put in a Northern Lights, because that's usually my go-to if I'm having trouble. I'll put in a Northern Lights humbucker in it. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is great. <laughs> and then I go, well... I was actually happy with the neck pickup. And I go, well, I'll just put the other Northern Lights in there. So I put another Blackstock Northern Lights in there. I put the set in there, wired up. And then I put it on the wall. And then a couple of you guys were like, hey, you're going to review it. And I'm like, so I don't know how to review it now because I took the original pickups out and put my aftermarket pickups in it. But I thought for Guitar of the Week, since sometimes it's just about my personal guitars, that's my personal guitar. I play it. I love it. It's amazing. And um, I wouldn't change a thing. So there you go. Uh, and uh, maybe, you know, I don't know. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Let me know if you guys liked Guitar of the Week. We'll keep doing different ones. Uh, you know, I have some cool guitars in the collection I can show you guys and then other cool stuff too. Okay, so let's go on to the next subject, topic, question. Uh, tech Corner. Okay, so this one comes from Chris who says, why would a pickup company use rough cut magnets? Sometimes a rough cut sand cast, I got what you're saying, over polished magnets. Okay, I can tell you the answer, but he's got more to say. He says, looking at Seymour Duncan slash, a, uh, I think it's the Appetite APH, Appetite uh, 2 pickups, versus the new slash 2.0 humbuckers. Is this just marketing or does a rough cast uh, cut magnet, rough cut magnet do something uh, for the hotter slash 2.0. So uh, yes, sand casts, rough cut magnets, basically, yes. Um, the, it all comes down to, this is where it comes down, Chris, and it makes sense. It's not, we're not gonna talk better. We're not gonna talk, uh, you know, magic unicorn powder, <laughs> okay? What we're gonna talk about is reproduction, okay? A lot of the stuff that happens is somebody gets like a pickup's easy. Pickup's no different than a pedal, than a you know, than a guitar, than an amplifier. You have a product, and in this case, it's a pedal, and you are sorry, a pickup. I got sidetracked. Uh, so you have a product that's a pickup, and it's magical, right? You love it, and so you want to recreate it. So they take it apart. That's basically how they do it. I've done many. That's how I learned to do pickups too. I took them apart. Um, you can you put them back together. You usually have to use all new wire, but 
Other than that, you can use all the components. And you just match up the wire. Make sure you use the same gauge and the same type of wire. So if it's enamel, use enamel. So farm varve, use farm varve, so on, so on, so on. 42 gra gauge versus 43 and 44, so on. Um, however, however, um, when they were reproducing pickups, they started noticing things. First of all, the technology changed. I mean, now they cut the pickups um, magnets precisely and they're smooth. And before they used to sand cast them and they have little rough marks in them, okay? And the truth is sh the shape of the magnet, the size of the magnet, how much gauze it has, and the little marks in it change the magnetic field. It's true. It's a fact. That's the fact. It It is as easy as science as that. Excuse me real quick. Move this chair forward. I feel like I'm leaning forward. Okay. Um, so that's true. It, it is absolutely scientifically proven. Now, does that translate to a glorious change of tone that we all can't believe? It translates to a subtle difference in something. <laughs> so this is where, like I said, you know, you can chase the unicorn pretty far. You can get pretty crazy with it. And what I really believe is this. If somebody was to say, look, uh, the magic to, like, if, you know, magic to Slash's pickup is an Alnico 2 magnet uh, with, you know, whatever wire, you know, gauge and type of wire he uses and the type of winds in the pattern uh, that he likes. Um, I'd, I'd say you got him 90% there. And he'd play the pickup and go, man, it's mag magic. And then if you were to say, oh, but then we got the right plastic, we got the right base plate, and we got sand cast magnets versus, you know, whatever, and we got the, you know, whatever, you know, whatever little details. Yeah, maybe get you another 1%, 2% there. So now you're, you know, 92% there. And then if you want to keep the crazy going, you can go, and then we got the original cardboard that they used to make the original boxes for the original pickups, <laughs> right? I mean, you can take it pretty far. People like... The, the reality of this is this, okay? The commodity being sold is authenticity. The irony is that Gibson screwing up that, you know, play authentic thing is actually funny because it could have been the greatest guitar marketing ever done in the industry if they didn't go out swinging and threatening everybody when they did it, which is their mistake. But the important part is this. Authenticity is the value that we are what we value. I don't know. God, see, I was trying to do something power, like a powerful speech. It's just, now I'm just a stupid ass. But authenticity is what we value. So here's a good example. I, I watched this on Shark Tank. It was a great episode. It was a long time ago. This woman was basically, had, her husband was a fireman. Uh, when they were done with their fire suits, she was cutting them up and putting them together, making backpacks out of them. And uh, she started selling them and she was making a lot of money and she's selling them. So she got the other wives to do it. And then she got the other firehouses because they learned that after so much time, they have to kind of retire their old fire uniforms and get new ones. And so they were just, you know, having the fire station send them the uniforms and they were making, uh, you know, new, more clothes, more clothes, not clothes, backpacks, satchels, you name it. And essentially... She went to the Shark Tank and said, this is what, you know, this is her business proposal. And they said, well, what do you want to do? And she's like, well, I want some money. And they go, what are you going to do with it? And she goes, well, I'm going to go to China. I'm going to have knockoffs made because everybody's knocking me off. And I'm going to sell the knockoffs for a lower rate. And they said, look, I'll pay you not to do it. Okay. And it was Damon said this. He goes, I'll pay you not to do that. He goes, here's why. He goes, he holds up the backpack and he goes, this backpack fought fires. Like this backpack's the real thing. Like in a world of you can have anything you want, right? Because it can be reproduced authentic is really the value. This, this is the real deal. And that's where the value comes from. Somebody likes the idea that, like, I have this thing, right, that was, uh, you know, that a fireman used, and it's really cool. So the same thing with musical instruments is the same, same proposition. It's like, okay, this is the, I have the original tube screamer. I have the original clon pedal. I have the original thing. And that has value because it's authentic, right? Um, it is, it is the real thing. Um, so it has provenance, you know, and we know when we go back, we can go, okay, this is the real thing. You're playing a real Dumble. You're playing a real 57 Strat. You're playing a real 59 Les Paul. Um, you know, this is, this is what we value. And so at some point, somebody wants to cash in on more than that. And they go, well, I can reproduce it, but it's a replica. It's not authentic. 
So then the, the marketing logic becomes, well, how do I make something that's a replica feel authentic? And you go, oh, we're going to use the same type of magnet. We're going to use the same capacitor to use. We found original, like a Fender was to say, this has gone so crazy over the years. A Fender was to make an announcement tomorrow like, hey, we were going through an old warehouse in California and Hollywood and we found the original paint. And now we're going to paint, <laughs> we're going to paint, you know, 5,000 guitars with original 60s paint. <laughs> you know, it would go through the roof. So to answer your question, there is some science behind what they're saying. And it is true. It makes a difference. But my, my belief is the difference was subtle. And now it's just more of the marketing hype. So it is both those things. It is a slight difference and marketing hype. So um, that's that's how you go about it. I, I have, when it comes to pickups, I have done no crazier thing than anything with pickups. When I, like guitars, amps, pedals, I've gone down endless roads of insanity with all this stuff throughout my life. But pickups, I went the deepest with Chrome going crazy. And the and I came out the other side with realizing that there's, a, just like guitars, just like pedals, and just like amps, pickups, there was a few amazing ones that were designed. And for some reason, that's not good enough. The fact is, I can name a dozen pickups right now that are just the most amazing pickups. Universally can be used almost in every situation. They're just amazing. But... They're just, it's not ever, it's not new. It's not exciting. It's not authentic. And so now they have to make new stuff. That's why they're always going to be making new stuff because there's always a proposition. And the new stuff is either new innovation or it's more authentic. <laughs> and I could, I feel like more authentic is cheaper to do than innovation. Telling people like, hey, you know how we used to do it a crappy way? We're doing it that way again. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, yeah, to answer your answer question. So I would imagine the new ones are better, but not because of rough cast magnets or whatever. Because they can improve them. They can figure out what they, you know, that's the best thing about when you make something. When you make it, it's great, but then years and years of having it, you get to dissect it again and then go, I should have done this a little bit, maybe a little better. Um, this says, hi, Phil. Hi, Phil. What kind of paint is used on Fenders and Squires? Uh, oil-based or acrylic paint. It is uh, polyurethane and urethane paint is the two they use. They don't use nitrocellulose uh, lacquer overseas in the... Uh, um, uh, well, you didn't say overseas. You just said Fender and Squires. So Squinter and Squires are over, overseas. So Squires were all going to be urethane and polyurethane. I don't know which one's which. Uh, I don't know if they're either or or both. Um, you know, they're really hard to disclose that stuff, and I don't know how to disseminate the differences between all the little type of paint types. Um, the uh, fenders, uh, the made in Mexico should be urethane, I think. Polyester, I think they're, yeah, they're polyester. And then I think the American ones are polyurethane, I believe. Because if I think I remember correctly, and I'm trying to do this off memory, and this is my guess, I think I remember that Jackson guitars made in the USA are polyester and made in Mexico guitars are polyester. But, um, uh, American fenders are polyurethane. And I think what I remember that is I thought when I was in the factory once, a couple of times I went to the factory, there was somebody at the factory explaining to me that the main reason they did this is that polyester is so shiny. It looks so good that they, that's why they use it on the Jacksons, but they don't use it on the USA fenders because they don't want them to look that good. Because remember, the more, the more perfect a fender strat looks, especially if you've ever seen a fender, like a knockoff fender strat, when they make the, the sunburst, it looks too shiny and too good. It looks fake. <laughs> so so uh, obviously like that one's nitro and it's all beat up and stuff. So, I mean, that's, that's when they say, like, that's the, well, the, you know, the green screen right there. Anyways, um, so that's what I believe they are, if that helps. Uh, again, that's my guess. There's more to the question. It says, also, uh, I was putting a knob on a split shaft potentiometer and I pushed right through to the bottom of the pot. Is there a way to fix that or am I stuck? Well, it depends on the potentiometer. Most potentiometers, what's going to happen is they have a can. It's at the bottom. It has four tabs. They're like teeth that bend over. And so when you push this, uh, you're pushing on the pot, the uh, shaft pushes against that and pushes right through, which is what it's supposed to do. You should be able to reassemble it. No problem. Um, 
you know, take some time, clean it, use some contact cleaner, go ahead and put it back together. I, what would I do? I would probably put it back together because I would just put it together back together real quickly. Um, in some cases, the pot is not the can with the, the four teeth bent over the top. It It is sealed or it's it broke because they like, you know, it's, it was basically molded and now it's broken. That is rare, but it happens. And then that one you want to toss. Um, the other, the party question is, should you replace it? You could just replace it too. I mean, it's up to you. I personally, um, Claudia, it's the Claudia. Thank you for the question. Both at the very least, both try to fix it. And then if you can't buy a new one, either way, try to fix it because that's how you're going to learn. You're going to learn about it. It's not a complicated, uh, it's part. It's like, so you have the two, you have the, well, you're going to have like three parts. So you have the shaft, you have, which is one, it's all connected to one piece. Usually you're going to have the wiper. Sometimes that can be separate in a piece or connected. You're going to have a plate and then you're going to have the can. So I'm going to say it's four parts, right? It's not a whole lot of parts, it's not a super complex thing together. And when you put together, uh, you know, it's one of those things, if you put it together wrong, it only takes reversing a few things to get it right. Cause it's 50, 50, you're going to get it right. So super easy. Um, Okay. All right. This one was, oh no. This one says, Phil, you said if Elon Musk, oh, if you were Elon Musk and if you had, okay, I'm reading this wrong. He says, Phil, <laughs> it says, Phil, you said if you were, if you had Elon Musk's money, you still wouldn't buy a $20,000 guitar. What if Steve, I sold one of his universe's guitars for $40,000? Uh, no. Okay, so first of all, I was uh, being a little sarcastic with the Elon Musk kind of money. What I meant was millions of dollars. I don't know, you know, billionaires. Uh, it's, it's a silliness I can't comprehend. Uh, here's the here's the real answer to your fun question. Uh, if I w won the lottery and had millions and millions and tens of millions of dollars, um, a forty thousand dollar universe would be the absolute last thing I would care about. Um, it's just not how I'm wired. It's and what's nice is it's not my, how my wife's wired. Um, I during COVID I did buy some more expensive guitars and I do like expensive guitars. I have them, and uh, and I will tell you this: it's more the inflation of things. Like when I pay crazy money for guitars now, it's because five years ago those guitars now are with inflation to what I was spending five years ago on guitars. Um, to do a $20,000 guitar, I'd have to jump four times more than I've ever spent on a guitar. Okay. So that's, so not 40, just 20. The most I've ever spent on a guitar is $5,000, which is crazy. Now I want to be very clear. Um, I bought a $5,000 guitar. I think I bought two. I did two by two. $5,000 guitars, uh, over a period of two years or whatever. And, um, I regret both to this day. Uh, that's it. I can, that's all I can tell you. I regret them. It's not like I'm, I regret the money aspect so much. I just don't, I don't, I cannot quant qualify a why I love them more than anything else. I don't, they're not my two favorite guitars. They're not in my top 10 favorite guitars. They, that's what it is. Um, so if I was super rich and I bought a $40,000 universe, it would be wall art at that point. So, I mean, I guess if I was so rich, I was buying $40,000 paintings throughout the house. And I guess, well, I might as well stick one of my guitar, this guitar I want to look up on the wall. I have a logic, but I, I'm not really wired that way, um, monetarily wise, money wise. I'm not wired to think about things or care about things like that way. This is the part I, I try to be upfront about the podcast. There's a little bit of me in this podcast, of course, right? This is me and who and you hear me every week and this is who I am. And there's a little bit of, I make YouTube content for a living. And there's a little bit of like, I need a background, <laughs> you, you know? Uh, remember, I'm in a bedroom right now, okay? This is a, this is an office, but it's a, it's a home office. I, I could have had a bed here on the thing and a dresser and I could be sitting on the corner of the bed doing the show, but I just thought, oh, it looks more professional if I build it out like a studio and I put guitars on the wall. That's why I did it. So the irony, so, you know, just to give you a reference of things, here's the irony of my YouTube channel. Since I started my YouTube channel, I've been in three rooms. Okay. This is kind of funny. So you've seen me in three rooms. The very first room, if you go to those videos, that is the biggest room. <laughs> that is the room that I was actually in. It was a really big room and I was in a little corner of it making videos because, um, because I was filming with my phone and I didn't even have a tripod and I needed to, I was holding the bed on like a pillow or holding the 
the phone on a pillow and then balancing on like a bar stool, whatever I was doing, it was all, that's how I was doing it. And uh, then once YouTube started doing its thing and I thought, oh, I should up the game somehow. This seems more professional because people would complain. People would, um, I'm going to tie again about YouTube. I'm sorry, but people would complain in my videos. They go, oh, you got 30,000 subscribers. You don't even have a light. I'm like, okay, I'll get a light. And they go, oh, you have 100,000 subscribers. You can't even get a good camera. I'm like, okay, I'll get a good camera. <laughs> so it was really just that. People saying like, I can't believe you're not buying better mics. Because it was always like this insult of like, I can't believe he's getting these views and he's not using, you know, the best equipment. And I was like, all right, so I just get the equipment and then I would up things. And then, so I switch. The second room I in was, was in the smallest room of the three, by the way. It was a super tiny room. Super tiny. Uh, it, I should have got, uh, I tell people to this day, I should have got an award for how that room does not look tiny. and Because <laughs> it looked, I, in the videos you can't tell, but it's super tiny. And then this room is bigger than that room, but not probably as big as you perceive it. Because again, it's... Uh, so there you go. So uh, to answer your question, um, you know, this is a background for YouTube. <laughs> and uh, so I guess, yeah, if I had if I won millions of dollars and I'm still doing YouTube, maybe I would do something crazy. But uh, for me personally, it's the this is this wouldn't exist. Like if I stopped doing YouTube tomorrow, this would all come down the next day. This is not how I would have things set up because uh, I don't really I don't come in here and look at this. This is for the background of the videos. It's again, it's to look more professional. Like, hey, I'm a real person on the internet doing real things. That's how we all do it, right? So trying to trying to do it. Okay, we gotta button this up, I think. How are we doing on time? We're all, we're almost there, we're done. Let's Oh my goodness. Um Okay, there's so many, these questions are so long, guys. Okay, let's try Ron, Ronin67 says, Hey, Phil, I'm in the market for a new low watt lunchbox amp. I know you had the 6505, the EVH 5150 LBX series, as well as the MT15, and I can go on forever and ever. The Ignator, I've had them all, all of them, all the Mesa boogies, all of, all of them, all the Voxes. So let's just say all the little amps for the most part, uh, that you recently purchased. Could you explain what, in your opinion, these amps strengths and weaknesses are and what you would recommend as the most versatile covering rock blues? It's the Engel Fireball 25. That is the amp to get. Uh, I just had a buddy reach out to me recently through text and he's like, Hey, I'm looking for a high gain amp with a great clean. It's the Engel Ball, uh, Engel, Engel Ball, it's the Engel Ball, Engel Ball, Ball Burdink. It's the Ingle Ball, Ingle Fireball 25. So out of all the amps, uh, I like the MT-15. It's great. I like, uh, and, and if you're trying to save scratch, go those routes. They're more affordable. But to me, the Ingle Fireball 25, it's made in Germany. It's got a noise gate. The clean is good. The high gain is great. You can also get mid gain. You can get rock. You can get blues. You can get anything out of it. It's built like a tank. It looks in my opinion, it's cool. It's a great amplifier. In fact, out of all the amplifiers, it's my absolute favorite amplifier to this day. It's why I sold my Saldano. It's because I don't care because the Fireball uh, is close. It does a lot of things. Um, you know, it's got an effects loop. I can put some uh, reverb and delay through the effects loop if I want. I love the attenuation. So it has a noise gate. So if I want to run high gain and I don't want to listen to all the hissing, noise gate it off. If I want to play at late at night and I don't want to have to readjust the controls the next day, I just power stage it down in the back. It's great. I don't think you'll regret it. Um, if you, I, I don't really show you guys all my amps anymore, but if you saw how much I've decreased the amps, you'll know that there's just a few amps that I love and that's the amp that I kept for that stuff. I still have the MT-15, <laughs> so you know, and I really like it. I like the EVH uh, 5150. I liked LBX. I like all these. I, got, I can say great things about all these amps, but realistically, if you want me to recommend something that I truly recommend uh, without a caveat. So think about this. I recommend the Engel Fireball even if you have $3,000. So if you said I have $3,000 for a small amp, what would I recommend? Engel, Ball, Engel Fireball 25. Uh, if you said I only have $500, then I have to adjust because the Engel, Engel Fireball is about $1,300. But you can get a deal on it, but it's still going to cost you about $1,200. To totally, totally worth it. Buy one used. Either built like tanks. That's my opinion. Um, 
Okay, Jay says, Phil, love the show and the direction you are going. I know I'm going south right now. And then this is north. And back to south. This humor is not going to fly on the show. Okay, it says, I, I, <laughs> I love the direction. I want to use an amp modeling pedal. Um, okay, like the Iridium or the UA Lion. Uh, for my live rig, I want to use two outputs, one speaker emulation <laughs> to go direct. Oh my goodness, this is so much. And a second output uh, with no emulation to go to the power amp, cab, not FRFR. Most pedals don't seem to allow this output setup speaker is emulation. Is there an either? Uh, I have no idea, man. <laughs> You've already lost me. This is definitely a pe that pedal show question. Jay, here is my advice. Go to that pedal show live thing and ask those guys. Ask Mick and Dan because, wow, I have no idea. This is, so like, I like to keep my rig simple. I don't, I've told you guys this before. If I play out, it's usually in a very short amount of time to set up on the stage or jump on stage with people. The, I don't have the luxury of complicated rigs when it comes to a live performance thing. So my live performance logic is always, how simple can I keep it? Um, and that's it. Because I can't play two songs in one night and be halfway through the, one of those songs messing around with gear. That's just, dude, that's all people remember about you. Like that bald guy, man, man, he couldn't get his stuff dialed in. Didn't this guy say he knows his gear or something? <laughs> so yeah, Jay, that's my suggestion to that. Sorry. Um, okay, let's do, um, let's do one more. Hold on a second. Let me see if there's a moderator. I have some moderator questions. Okay. Maybe I don't. Yeah, I do. Derek wants to know, with the prices of guitars now, do you think it would be better idea to buy a kit that you like and mod it up or buy a Squire Epiphone, etc.? Um, kit guitars, I've never been a huge fan of kit guitars. I, I, I admitted that I had done a few for customers because they brought them to me and I kind of had to do them. And then... Uh, when I started the YouTube channel, you guys brought it up so much that I did a couple kit guitars, uh, including the the one for the the, the great guitar build off thing. So I've done a couple kit guitars for the videos of the channels. I have to tell you, here's the the thought on that. They are they are fun, and so I you know go for it. But I think I prefer taking a really solid guitar and then modifying that. I think that's more of a an interesting thing for me. I feel like I have something more tangible. So. I don't know what you get. So to me, the only the advantage of a kit guitar is if the kit guitar is like a paddle headstock, so you can shape your own headstock or make it so much that's so much more personal than maybe a Squire and Upphone. So to me, a kit guitar is if you want to learn more about building guitars, that's a good information thing to learn, but also if you want it to be more uniquely your own. Otherwise, if it's a quality thing, buy the Squire, the Upphone, another brand and mod it. That's what I would suggest as a, as a suggestion. That's what I suggest as a suggestion. Um, okay, let me refresh this last thing. Okay, load. Okay. Uh, last one, we'll go with Chris. Chris says, Phil, I just start i started to pick up the bass and i'd like to know what amp pedals etc do you recommend for practicing at home and what do you recommend for playing gigs well you, you can be one and the same for sure if you're going to do both i would definitely just do one stop shop nowadays i i would say for a gig i don't know when you say gig i don't know what that means i don't know if you're playing with a drummer and a guitar player or if you're playing a metal band i don't know if you're playing at church i don't know um i, I say this all the time if I mean, if you want a guarantee, no, you know, you got the gig covered. I would go with a 210 combo or head and 210 cabinet with at least like 500 watts of solid state power. Um, that's that's a guarantee or a 115 cabinet and 500 watts of solid state power. That's kind of like, okay, you got the situation covered. What have I found that I can pull off most gigs, especially if they have a PA and stuff, is a 112 combo or 112 cabinet and head, uh, as long as it's a quality one. So, you know, you can get away with that. What's nice about that, either one of those rigs um, you can use at home. The, I, the only problem about base rigs at home is if you use a 210 or a 112 or 115 and you're at home, even if you turn it down, you'll find you're quiet in the room, but people in the other front room are going to be like, man, there's like rumbling sounds driving nuts because the bass kind of travels up the walls and through the floors. So I tend to uh, play... 
a smaller uh, amp. Um, I have a two-story house, so I'm upstairs. And so upstairs, I use a Phil Jones because it doesn't transfer a whole lot of bass because um, I don't want bass to go through the floor. And, you know, like a, I'm like the neighbor, right? Upstairs neighbor of the apartments, somebody below me. But um, in your case, I would say if you think small gigs are your thing, I would go with the 112 combo. If you think you're going to do moderate size gigs or if you want the power on tap or if you're going to play outside, get the 210 at least combo or head and cabinet and the 115 head and cabinet. And call that a day. You'd be set. So that's my suggestion. All right. That was good. It was a good show. The Know Your Gear podcast is not responsible for any spontaneous guitar purchases you make during or after the show. And as always, I want to thank you guys so much for your time. We'll see you next week. And uh, I'm going to say Know Your Gear.